Hello, my name is Leslie Sosa and I'm a first year civil engineering student. Today, my team and I will be presenting the research that we worked on during this fall quarter. So our team name was Team Burton 2023. Our research was seismic research and this consisted of Agnes Patoka, Andres Morales, Leslie Sosa, and Sarah Soto. Our advisors for this research were Professor Henry Bur Dr. Henry Burton, our grad student Laxman, and our undergrad student Sebastian. I will now be handing the floor to Agnes. Thank you so much, Leslie. Hello, everyone. My name is Agnes Patoka, and I'm a first-year civil engineering student, and I had the amazing opportunity to partake in the seismic research hosted by Dr. Henry Burton this year. I'm quickly going to go over our agenda for today, which is very exciting. So first, we have the introduction, followed by the project description and overview. Our third point is going to be the applications and concepts, followed by the accomplishments and challenges. Our fifth point is going to be the key things learned through the project. And our sixth and final point is going to be the future directions of the project. I'm now going to leave the floor to Andres. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, my name is Andres Morales. I'm also a first-year civil engineer, and I was a technician manager in this project, which I would focus on the coding aspect of this project, basically. Leslie was a lab bug manager who made sure every member of the team updated their journal entries throughout the week and throughout the project. Agnes was a research manager and she had to collect and analyze the data that we used. Sarah was a project manager and her main job was to ensure all goals are met within our timeline. And next up is our project manager, Sarah. Thank you, Andres. My name is Sarah Soto. I'm a first year civil engineering major. And the second topic we'll be covering today is project description and overview. In our, in our research, we take data gathered from accelerometer sensors in buildings all over California and use machine learning models to predict a building's future response to an earthquake in a specific area. The two very important key aspects of our seismic research are the use of relational databases, which is also known as RDB, and in these relational databases, we store the historical data that are gathered from buildings with accelerometer sensors. And we also use machine learning models, also referred as ML, where we leverage the historical data gathered to build and code ML models. The RDB consists of data spanning from a range of 36 years, from 1984 to 2020. This data was collected as part of the California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program. The California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program is a program where data is collected from strong motion instruments, and that data is used to develop to develop recommended changes to seismic provisions of building codes to assist local governments in their general plan process and to aid emergency response personnel in the event of a disaster. So the machine learning models that are implemented and coded take the data stored in relational databases and are used to predict building models, building responses, such as its acceleration and displacement. Now, Relational databases. Relational databases, which is a factor I just mentioned in the previous slide, is a type of database that uses a structure to allow us to identify and access data in relation to another piece of data in the database. The goal of these databases is to streamline the storage and retrieval of seismic response data, along with associated earthquake and building parameters, which means that the purpose of relational databases is to help us researchers store and retrieve this very important data efficiently. The features of RDBs include the primary key, which is a unique identifier of each row in a table, the foreign key, which is a reference link to an external table, the attribute, which are features that appear in a table, the schema, which is a collection of all tables and links, and the query, which is a request, which is a request for data or information. Now I will pass it on to Agnes, where she will get into applications and concepts. Thank you, Sarah. I'm now going to cover the third point in our agenda, which is the applications and concepts. Now, this point is very particular because it contains two subdivisions, which are entitled the key scientific concepts and the key mathematical concepts. Let's move on to the key scientific concepts. So next slide. We're first going to take a look at the effects of ground motion. Buildings respond to earthquake shaking in various ways, and there are multiple factors that contribute to those specific responses. First, there's the building's proximity to the earthquake. Buildings located closer to the epicenter of an earthquake generally experience more severe shaking compared to those at a greater distance. Now, some properties of earthquake ground motion are intensity and frequency constants. Intensity refers to the strength or amplitude of ground shaking during an earthquake, and frequency content represents the range of oscillations in ground motion. Different buildings have, diff have natural frequencies at which they resonate. All this to say that the intensity of ground motion directly influences the, the, the dynamic behavior of a building. Next slide. Now, 
Let's take a look at the dynamic responses of buildings and remote sensing. Some tools used to comprehend how buildings react to ground motion are structural, structural testing, computer simulation, and remote sensing. Structural testing involves subjecting physical building models to controlled ground motions to observe real-time real structural behavior. And shake table tests replicate earthquake-like vibrations, allowing researchers to study the dynamic responses of structures. Computer simulation use, utilizes numerical methods to model and analyze how buildings respond to seismic ground motions. And it also allows for the virtual testing of structures under various earthquake scenarios. Now, remote sensing is when ground-based sensors, such as accelerometers, monitor building movements during seismic events. Remote sensing also enhances risk modeling by providing detailed information on the geographic distribution of vulnerabilities. I'm now going to leave the floor to Leslie Sosa. Thank you so much, Agnes. So now I will be getting into the key mathematical concepts we learned. Next slide. So the first concepts that we had a master was first becoming proficient in querying the structural query based database using Python to learning how to use the code. The second concept was acquiring the ability to conjoin the different tables. So as you can see in the picture below, we have an example of the tables that we can join together. And the third concept was being able to facilitate the extraction of the data. So the other picture on the right would be an example of how we use the code to collect the data and pull out the ones we wanted to use. Next slide. On the next one, we have a database key that we used in the SQL. So for example, what this allowed us to do is we have building ID. Now in the SQL or in the Python coding, it would appear as ID. Another example would be the number, the story, the number of stories, which would appear as number underscore stories underscore above. Next slide, please. So this is the manner through which the database key translates into the SQL or structured query language. So as I mentioned, ID here would be an example of building ID. Name would be the building name and the date it took place. So now I will be handing over the floor to Sarah. Thank you, Leslie. Now, when using SQL for this research, data needs to be imported to SQL first before anything can happen or be used. Our Google Drive is where all this information is stored. And the data from the drive then needs to be mounted to SQL. And this data is extracted from virtual libraries, which we have named Panda, SQL Lite 3, OS, and there are also many more. Now, I will hand it to Andres. Thank you, Sarah. Before we get to the machine learning, I'll actually talk about exploratory data analysis, which is what helps us understand which variables could be important in predicting the y-axis or the responses. With all this info, we can start using machine learning models. We can use scatter plots, pie charts, bar graphs, or even tree maps. EDA will tell us what factors to look at and to predict future data as accurate as possible. We created a histogram on the left-hand side to organize different amounts of earthquakes based on magnitude and each color, also representing the type of fault. Similarly, we did so on the right-hand side based on the number of stories of each building with each color representing the type of building. Again, organizing data into plots or charts helps us determine which parameters to look at when creating a machine learning model. And I'll be passing it on to Leslie again. Thank you, Andres. So now we, I will be talking about the introduction to machine learning. So our goal is to create predictive models using the recorded data from the historical earthquakes. So we learned about machine learning, which has three different main branches. There's unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. In our research, we got to work with supervised learning. And on the next slide, I will be talking about the two different branches. So our first branch of supervised learning is regression. In regression, we use different equations to predict the impacts of the earthquakes. And we want it to be within the 99 percentile for this data to be accurate. In the second, no, I'd have to start. I just want to yeah, yeah. OK. Next slide. Next slide. So in this slide, I will be talking about the two different. OK, well, let me start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Next slide. So in this slide, I will be talking about the two different branches of the supervised learning. So the first one we have is regression. Regression is when we use different equations to predict the accuracy of the data that we implement. So we want this accuracy to be within the 99 percentile. That way we know it's accurate and correct. Our second type is class classification, which has three different branches, binary, multi-class, and multi-label. Uh, an example of what classification can be is when we receive emails. Our emails are either classified 
into our primary inbox or they're classified as spam. And I will now be handing it to Andres. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, so like Leslie said, we use uh, different types of classifications, you know, those KG boos, K neighbors, random forests, or decision trees. There's much more. Machine learning and random forests and all the machine learning types use a majority percentage of the data in order to create a prediction model. For instance, they use 70% of the data to create a machine learning model to then predict the rest of the 30% of, of the points. In this case, random forest is only 66 to 67% accurate, which isn't the greatest. And like Leslie said before, we were aiming for 99 to even 100% accuracy. The important features on the left-hand side show how explanatory data analysis is important because we are seeing how random forest doesn't use all factors or details of a building earthquake pair of data in order to predict future models. Some parameters are more important and bigger deciders. Next slide. In this slide, I'm talking about random forest and how it's a type of machine learning. Random forest is a type of decision tree and the way it works in the real world, I'm gonna explain in the real world terms, is by asking a machine a question, like asking, should I accept the job? Through smaller questions, like do you want a base salary 50K? Are you willing to commute? Do you see yourself here for 10 years? That way the machine learning is learning from the person and eventually to lead to an answer based on how you respond. Obviously, in this model of the what we're using, the databases of the most the questions are much more elaborated, specific, and different. And there's a hundred of them. You know, talks about magnitude, longitude, the damage, and so on. The goal of these decision trees, like all machine learning models, is to then average out the predictions and use this new model to predict future data. And I'll be passing on to Agnes. Thank you, Andres. I'm now going to cover the fourth point on our agenda for today, which is the accomplishments and challenges. Now, moving on to accomplishments. First, we have data collection and cleansing. Our team successfully gathered a diverse and extensive data set of seismic activity. We also carefully cleaned and pre-processed the data. We then have SQL database, database implementation where we effectively designed and implemented a structured query language or SQL database to manage and organize the seismic data. Finally, we have the mach machine learning model development where we leverage our expertise and develop machine learning models using the pre-processed data, as you can see in the image on the right. I'm now going to leave the floor to Andres. Thank you, Agnes. Some of the challenges we face include data quality issues. Obviously, we don't know how accurate the sensors are, which I'm pretty sure they pretty much, for the most part, are accurate, but you know, there's always a human flaw. There was complexity of seismic events. Obviously, earthquakes aren't predictable and don't follow a linear model. There were also a few resource constraints as first years, most of us, we had no uh, you know, previous knowledge or work to look back on. There was also interdisciplinary collaboration, which was a challenge as bridging a gap between a vast database of seismic research that we didn't conduct ourselves and machine learning fields doesn't sound easy to even begin with. And even with all the help we had, this was all new to us. Coding in general was new to the four of us as we had to learn to read in a Python language. Even if it was just to know how what to copy and paste, we had to know what errors we had, like the picture showing up like on my slide right now which in this case means that uh, the pandas library in our code was not defined, which means that we did not properly download the data into our Google Drive. And next up is Leslie. Thank you, Andres. So now I will be talking about the key things that we learned in this project. So first, and like Andres mentioned, a lot of us were new to coding. So the first thing that we learned was how to code in Python and the structured query language. The second thing that we were able to learn is the concepts of relationship databases. So how they relate to the data that we're collecting and how it goes into our programming. The third concept that we were able to know was how to utilize and store the data into the databases. So being able to pull out the information that we wanted and knowing how to code it. Our fourth and final concept that we were able to learn was the fundamental of machine learnings and their models. And I will now be handing the floor to Sarah. Thank you, Leslie. Now for the sixth topic, the future direction of the project. There are ongoing research projects within the Burton Research Group that still utilizes the data from the California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program. The Burton Research Group is the group that our research is, facil is facilitated under. The future of this research is that it will be used to leverage historical data to build advanced ML models to advance the current state-of-the-art structural health monitoring. And finally, our group is very grateful and appreciative of this opportunity and our advisors who allowed us to learn about a new sector of civil engineering. Now, before we go, we would like to acknowledge our advisors and mentors who have supported us throughout our research. First, we have Henry Byrne, who is the head of the, research of the Burton Research Group. Second, we have Laxman Dahio, who is the PhD student that guided us through the project. And last, but certainly not least, is Sebastian Galicia, our undergraduate student. We couldn't have done this research without either of these three people, so thank you so much, Laxman, Dr. Burton, and Sebastian. 
And with that, that is all for us. So thank you so much for listening.